Thanks to the Thundertones this morning for their prelude in introducing the Veggie Tales theme of the morning with the Veggie Tales fanfare. It was three years ago that we first invited Phil Vischer to speak in chapel to tell his story, to tell the story behind Veggie Tales. Of course, one chapel was a good start, but we needed to have Phil back, and this is his fourth visit to Wheaton College Chapel in these last three years. Phil Vischer uh, has a unique entree into the lives of this generation of college students, your generation, because of your familiarity with Veggie Tales. Phil is the founder of Big Idea uh, Productions, and he's the co-creator of Bob the Tomato, Larry the Cucumber, and other animated characters. His latest venture is Jellyfish Labs, a creative work founded to develop new faith-based projects for kids and families. Please welcome back to Wheaton College Chapel, Phil Vischer. Good morning. Hi, kids. I'm back. I have to do this for the freshmen because they weren't here last year. They didn't get it, so. Yes, yeah, see, okay, you're with me. You're, someone's paying attention. Ah, uh, you may know me as the somewhat uptight Bridges Asparagus. <laughs> or perhaps as a cantankerous decorative gourd who loves his cheeseburger. <laughs> Good job on the song, by the way. Thank you very much. Oh, uh, <laughs> a really old grape with sort of a Brooklyn accent. <laughs> Who oh, can't figure out why the heck he's in a show full of vegetables when he's a fruit? <laughs> <laughs> or maybe you just know me as the voice that says, and now it's time for Silly Songs with Laddie. The part of the show where Laddie comes out and sings a silly song. Okay, good. We got that over with. Um, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And good night. No. Um, okay, so this is my fourth chapel which is fun, except that it's only been three years, which means that if you're a senior, you've heard all of my talks, so I can't repeat myself. And that's annoying, because I don't have that many talks. Um, so I have to come up with new material. Uh, and, but I can do it, it's okay, it's okay, I can do this. Um, but this is the first time I've ever done chapel here with one of my own children as a student. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to make him stand up, but my son Jeremy is a freshman at Wheaton College, and I'm very excited about that. But he's not the only one. You probably know that my mother is a professor at Wheaton College, Scott, Scotty May, who's sitting over there. Um, but you probably don't know that uh, my nephew is a junior at Wheaton College, and I have two second and or third cousins, I can never keep that straight, that are also here as students right now. So technically, if everyone woke up on time, there are five people in this room that are related to me. So your challenge is, before the end of the day, to see if you can identify, locate all five of them, tag them, and if you're the first person to do that, yell, bingo! <laughs> and then, whoever's around you will give you a prize. I don't know what the prize is, they haven't told me, but you'll get, so pocket change, a warm hug, I'm not sure what it is, not too warm, I'm hoping, um, <laughs> some sort of a prize. Okay, I, uh, the first time I was here I talked about VeggieTales because that seemed kind of obvious. Uh, the second time I was here I talked about post VeggieTales because that also seemed kind of obvious. Uh, the third time I was here I didn't know what I was going to talk about, so I talked about worldview and some, I don't know, philosophical musings that I was having. Uh, and then they invited me to come back a fourth time and I thought, oh boy, I'm really out on a limb now. Um, but I, I, I've had these thoughts. I've been thinking about something, and I decided, okay, they invited me back again. I'm going to try to put these thoughts down on paper. And they're thoughts about the world um, from my perspective, kind of the way I see it. Uh, and, and this may turn into, I don't know, an e-book on Amazon or something. So I'm testing this out on you. This is like, you know, it's like Jay Leno going to the little comedy club down the street to try some stuff before he does it on The Tonight Show. So consider yourself guinea pigs. Um, and tell me if it doesn't go well, and we'll forget about the whole thing. This world isn't what we expect when we're young. 
I don't know if any of you have found this to be the case. When we're we little tots, the world seems so friendly. All the grown-ups smile at us and tell us we're great. When we're hungry, they feed us. When we're sad, they stop everything and try to make us smile. Everything we touch, everything that's put into our little worlds is soft and fuzzy. When you are very small, the world appears to be made of Nerf. <laughs> and then we get older. Inevitably, things happen that confuse us, that shake our faith in a friendly, nerfy world. Life on earth disappoints us. If God has a frequently asked questions page for life on earth, there would be a million different questions, but also basically just one. Why? Why are things the way they are? Why aren't they the way I think they should be? Why does human life on earth fall so far short of its potential? Some of us know exactly what we want life to be like because we've seen it in person, rising like the new Jerusalem out of the swamps of central Florida, Disney World. <laughs> A perfect little world with no trash, no crime, no hunger, no poverty, where nothing is broken, everyone has fun, and no one ever gets hurt. We like Disney World because it paints a picture of what we once thought the world would be like in all its nerfy goodness, the world of a toddler come to life for everyone. That's the deal we make when we go to Disney World. 90 bucks for 10 hours in a perfect world. 90 bucks for a day in a world the way we always hoped it would be. I know this is the deal because I've seen how people react in Disney World when something actually does go wrong. People have died in Disney World. A man had a brain aneurysm on Big Thunder Mountain Railroad and came back to the loading station dead. Several years ago, one monorail ran into another, killing the driver. The local news showed up to interview a witness who said the same thing people always say when something goes wrong at Disney World. This isn't supposed to happen here. No, not here. We had a deal. 90 bucks for the suspension of everything we don't like about the world. When we are very young, the world looks to us like one big amusement park built solely for our enjoyment. It looks so fun on TV and in the movies, but then we discover that it is not entirely so. One day we reach out to hug the world, and the world bites us like a cute but ill-tempered dog. The world bites us right in the heart, and we say, hey, that wasn't supposed to happen, and suddenly we see that the world isn't the friendly, nerfy place we thought it was. The world is unpredictable. It's dangerous. We change the way we view the world. We write a new story to explain our lives on earth. A few weeks ago, I was in a store that sold hip collectible toys, toys for stylish nerds. One toy in particular caught my eye. It was a little pink pig, a cute little pig wearing some sort of parka. Only his eyes and his little piggy nose peeked out of the parka, and most intriguingly, the parka was covered with spikes. A little pink pig in a pink spiked parka. That's unusual, I thought. So I picked up the box that came in. The toy was called a cactus friend. The spiked parka was, in fact, a cactus suit. The copy on the back of the box said this, Cactus friends, the cactus is a sign of protection. Kids are naive and vulnerable and need protection. Sandy and her friends zip themselves into cactus suits because they think the world is a cold and scary place and they need some armor to face it. <laughs> so Merry Christmas, kids. Enjoy your new toy and your new philosophical outlook on life. <laughs> Clearly, this toy was designed by someone who had felt the world sting, who reached out for a hug and got a bite instead. Their response? Put on your cactus suits, everyone. The world is a dangerous place. It's a common response to the world we live in. We buy insurance policies, alarm systems. We build gated communities. We strive to control our surroundings as much as possible. We build bubbles of security in a dangerous world. We put on cactus suits. It's a common response, but is it a Christian response? Many Christians get confused when the world bites back. 
Isn't there a loving God? Isn't He in charge? Isn't He capable of keeping the world from biting us? Aren't we doing what we're supposed to do? Love Him, follow Him, trust in Him? Isn't that the deal we signed up for? We play by the rules, and God is supposed to put us in bubbles of security, divine cactus suits. What's the point of following God's rules if we still get bitten? if bad stuff still happens, if rain falls on the just and the unjust alike. When faced with a disturbingly not nerfy world, I've seen two common responses from Christians. The first is to respond exactly how the rest of the world responds. Put on your cactus suits, buy your insurance policies and alarm systems, and pull back into bubbles of self-protection. The second response is to live in a semi-constant state of confusion. Life bites us and we say, why God, I'm one of the good guys. We're so convinced a pain-free life is part of the deal we've signed up for that we can only conclude we must not be doing it right. So we pray harder or just different. We worship harder. We work on our personal sins harder. And yet life still bites. In our confusion, we vacillate between denial, if I only work harder, then God will protect me from all the bad stuff, and disillusionment. God just isn't going to keep up His end of the bargain. Now, I'm not here to solve the problem of pain on earth. Uh, That far greater minds than mine have slogged through those swampy waters. I'm here to talk about our response to life's pain as followers of Jesus. Denying that pain is a part of life on earth is not a spiritually mature response, and running from that pain into self-protective bubbles is also not a spiritually mature response. So tell us, O great and wise Phil, the tomato, what is the spiritually mature response? Before I tell you that, I want to talk about maturity in general. How do you know when you are mature? You guys are all on the cusp of adulthood. How do you know when you've gotten there? When have you reached healthy adulthood? Not just in a spiritual context, but in any context. The best way is to take note of where you started how you approached life as a child. And the context I am going to use to illustrate this is the context of my very first puppy. We got a puppy when I was about 11 years old. Puppies are great. Everyone loves puppies. What's not to love about a puppy? Well, okay. The one thing in particular not to love about puppies is that they have not yet learned that some bodily functions should only be done outside. And so puppies will leave you surprises around the house. But this is how you know you were a child. One day you walk through the living room and find a surprise from your puppy. And by surprise, I don't mean birthday cake. As a child, you say, not my problem. A grown-up will take care of that. And you walk right by the surprise. Sure enough, the next time you walk through the living room, the surprise is gone. Cleaning up poop is unpleasant. It is something that grown-ups do because they're grown-ups. It is a sign of grown uppiness And then you go to high school, and then you go to college, and then you get married, and your wife says, hey, let's get a puppy so we can practice for having a baby someday. And this seems like a reasonable idea. Many people have dogs. Why, you've had a dog before yourself, and so you get a puppy. And not long after, you walk out of the bedroom in your small apartment and discover that your puppy has left a surprise for you next to your couch. So you say say instinctively, not my problem, a grown-up will take care of that. And then it dawns on you a frightening realization. You are the grown-up. If you don't clean up the surprise, it will stay there forever. (laughs) But a voice deep inside you cries out, it's icky, I don't want to pick it up. It's like that scene in Star Wars, the very first one, episode four or whatever. Princess Leia has been captured and is being held in the Death Star. So Luke Skywalker and Han Solo bust their way in to save her, and she says, aren't you a little short for a stormtrooper? And Luke says, huh? Oh, it's the suit. And he takes off his helmet and says, we're here to rescue you. And then bad guys come in and start shooting up the place, and Princess Leia says, you call this a rescue? And Han Solo shoots a big hole out of the wall next to them and tells everyone to jump into the hole. But then when it's Chewbacca, the Wookiee's turn to jump into the hole, he won't jump into the hole. He says, Roar, which apparently, <laughs> hang on, which apparently in Wookiee means there's a terrible smell coming from the hole. I don't want to jump in the hole. We know, we know this is what he says because Han Solo replies, I don't care what you smell, get in there. And then he kicks the Wookiee in the butt and knocks him into the hole. And this is what is happening as you stand in your apartment looking at dog poop. 
You have an inner Wookiee. <laughs> Stay with me. It's profound stuff. And your inner Wookiee is yelling, I don't want to pick it up. It smells bad. And then comes the moment of truth when we have to be Han Solo and say, I don't care what you smell, pick up the poop. We have to tell our inner Wookiee to shut up and do the thing we really don't want to do, the unpleasant thing. This battle, this struggle between us and our inner Wookiees, this is the struggle for maturity, for adulthood. And why is this important? Because puppies are just the beginning. After the puppy comes a baby, and babies make messes that even your dog would say, no way am I going near that. <laughs> and between the diapers and the throwing up, your inner Wookiee will be screaming out, I don't want to clean it up. Make the woman clean it up. She's the one who had the baby in the first place. <laughs> and you consider it for a minute, but you don't want to be that husband, that husband that won't change diapers or clean up vomit because, frankly, that husband is kind of a jerk. So you have to tell your inner Wookiee to shut up. You have to kick him in the butt and make him do the hard stuff because you're growing up. You're becoming someone you would actually admire. And why is this important? because this is about more than just messes. This is also about the time when you and your wife or husband aren't getting along at all, when the person you most want to be with has somehow become the person you least want to be with. It will happen. And maybe you're at work or on a business trip and you bump into someone new who makes you tingle all over just like when you first met your spouse and your inner Wookiee yells, I like it, more! And you're suddenly in a situation where you could blow up everything that you value just to chase a feeling. And your ability to make a tough choice, to turn to that inner voice and say, shut up, will change the direction of your life. My dad walked out when I was nine years old he left his wife and kids for another woman. He couldn't say no to that voice when it mattered most. One of my wife's relatives was the pastor of one of the biggest churches in Minneapolis. He was on the front page of the Minneapolis paper in a story about his church's amazing growth and success. And then a month later, he was back on the front page, this time because the elders of his church had confronted him at the airport on his return from a missions trip, telling him they'd become aware of the affair he was having with a church staff member. He lost his church, his ministry, his family. He couldn't say no to that voice when it mattered most. This is the maturity that's missing in our culture, the ability to say yes to what is hard but beneficial and no to what is easy but harmful, the ability to tell the inner Wookiee to shut up and do what needs doing. So what does this have to do with spiritual maturity? You knew we'd get there eventually. There are people in all societies who can do hard things, who can avoid bad choices. Some people are simply wired in ways that make rule following and self-control easier. Benjamin Franklin was one of them. Franklin attempted to achieve moral perfection solely through force of will. But even though he took great pride in his ability to improve his own moral character, he finally concluded that very few people could do what he had done. Franklin recognized that for most of humanity, all-encompassing moral restraints simply could not come from within. For most of humanity, the Wookiees usually win. This brings us to spiritual maturity, which is not simply becoming self-disciplined in spiritual matters. Spiritual maturity isn't the act of developing your own strength in spiritual areas of life. Spiritual maturity is the act of accessing external strength in all areas of life. Spiritual maturity isn't you making yourself a better Christian, it's Christ making you a better person. I want to make three points about a mature Christian on this earth. Why three? Because I've been listening to a lot of Tim Keller podcasts, and Tim Keller always has three points to make. Not two, not four, three. Here are my three points. A mature Christian sees the world as it really is. A mature Christian sees themselves as they really are. And a mature Christian responds accordingly. A mature Christian sees the world as it really is, 
sees themselves as they really are, and responds accordingly. Okay, the world as it really is. Walt Disney World is the most highly automated place on earth. The lights, the sound, the rides, everything is computer controlled. Nothing happens by accident at Disney World because there's an operating system behind the curtain and intelligence coordinating everything. So if two monorails run into each other, you know that something has broken down somewhere. Some system, some safeguard has failed crashed, been infected with a virus or something. Disney World is not a random world. There is intelligence behind it. And because we know the intelligence or intelligences behind Disney World do not want monorails running into each other, we therefore can assume that something in the systems that run Disney World has gone wrong. And what of the larger world? How do we read the data there? It's popular in some circles today to say the larger world is a closed, random environment. There's no transcendent intelligence behind the curtain, just random collisions and reactions on a variety of scales from the subatomic to the galactic. But the vast majority of humanity finds this point of view unpersuasive. They've seen too much. Whether it is transcendent values like love, justice, and beauty, transcendent experiences like near-miraculous coincidences and occurrences, transcendent beings like angels, demons, spirits, or God Himself, they've seen too much to believe in a closed universe. They know there is more. And for billions of these people, the most compelling explanation for the data is the biblical explanation. Like Disney World, they believe in an intelligence behind the universe, an intelligence that wants good, not evil. So the most plausible answer for a world that bites is that something has gone wrong in the system. There is a virus a bug in the operating system. The world isn't as it was meant to be. The biblical narrative tells us all about this virus. It is sin. Sin entered the world and monorails started crashing into each other almost immediately. Again, you've got philosophy professors to help you grapple with the problem of evil and the role of God and all that. I only have enough time to focus on our response. A mature Christian sees the world as it truly is, a broken amusement park. The potential for joy and fun is so great. The brochures look so good. But there's a bug in the system. The Dumbo ride may at random flip upside down and drop you on your head. You could be laughing your way through the Pirates of the Caribbean when suddenly an animatronic pirate pulls you from the boat and tries to drown you. The world and its inhabitants, seen accurately, have the beautiful potential of God, their creator, mixed with the ghastly reality of a toxic rebellion, of sin. A mature Christian is not surprised by either extreme. Secondly, a mature Christian sees themselves as they really are. And in this regard, I'm referring to one specific question. Am I safe here? Seeing the destructive potential of sin, the obvious answer is, no, not at all. I'm not at all safe here. And so we pull back into our protective bubbles, our cloisters, our cactus suits. We peer out from behind the curtains as the world burns outside. But this is a case where the obvious answer is not the correct answer, where Christian maturity leads to a different answer. Am I safe here? Yes although perhaps safe isn't the right word. Perhaps a better word is secure. I am older than you, most of you. I am old enough that I have lost things, things I thought I could not live without, loss so great I was certain it would damage me beyond repair. But it didn't. My losses, my heartbreaks, instead have driven me deeper and deeper into my relationship with God, so deeply that I now realize I didn't really need those things at all. We build little worlds around ourselves, sandcastles of safety, of identity, and we cling to those sandcastles because we can't imagine being okay without them. And then a storm comes and the sandcastle starts to fall. And if we grew up in the church, we pray and pray that God will hold our sandcastles together, that God will preserve what is precious to us, what defines us. And when He doesn't, we're shocked, confused, and God waits. He waits for us to stop staring at the spots where our sandcastles once stood and turn and look at Him. And when we do, he meets us there. He wraps his arms around us and he replaces our dopey, pathetic sandcastles with himself. 
the creator of the universe. Are we safe here? It depends on what you mean by safe. Are we safe from discomfort, from pain? Absolutely not. But we are secure in the arms of God. We need to know the difference between hurt and harm. As long as we live on a broken earth among broken people, we will hurt. There will be pain. But when we live in Christ, we are free from harm. Not free from hurt, but free from harm. I remember several years after the bankruptcy of my first company, Big Idea Productions, after I'd watched my dreams collapse, but then found myself falling into God's arms, I realized God had given me a whole new posture toward life. I remember saying to myself one day, I have nothing to fear because I'm already dead. Not dead in a morbid sense that I was now a zombie shuffling through life looking for brains to eat. Dead in a biblical sense. Dying to ourselves is the first step toward following Christ. He said it himself, take up your cross and follow me. Taking up your cross is the first instruction, and taking up your cross means you are going to die. You give up your life. You give up your ambition, your will, your hopes, your dreams, your dopey little sandcastles of self-identity and security. Give them up. Let them collapse. Let the waves wash them away. Lose your life and then find it again in Jesus. Live through Him. Find your identity in Him. And you will, over time, discover that the love of Christ is the only thing you truly cannot live without and the only thing you can never lose. That is security. I have nothing to lose because I am already dead. If I have nothing to lose, no one can harm me. Can they cause me pain? Sure, but heck, my dentist causes me pain and I've learned how to deal with that. A mature Christian sees themselves as they really are, secure, safe from harm, incapable of losing the only thing they cannot live without. And what does that knowledge make you? Fearless. Fearless. A mature Christian sees the world as it really is, an extraordinary creation broken by sin. A mature Christian sees themselves as they really are, secure, incapable of losing the only thing they cannot live without. And then a mature Christian responds accordingly by living fearlessly. Instead of running away from the world, we run toward it. The world is a broken amusement park. People are getting tossed off the Dumbo ride left and right. And what are we? We're the Red Cross. We aren't standing around griping about the broken rides because we know one day God is going to kill the virus and fix the park and make it as incredible as He always intended it to be, and then we will ride the rides forever. But we also aren't cowering in the bathrooms or behind the Dippin' Dots stand trying to stay safe from crazy Dumbo. We're out there in the middle of it, helping people, telling them the story of why the amusement park has gone berserk, pointing to the beauty of the design and explaining how someday the entire park will live up to its promise. And this goes back to my puppy dog analogy. We aren't surprised when we come across poop, because poop happens. Good one. Yeah. A t shirt. So, what do we do? We clean it up. We may be cleaning up literal poop, like Mother Teresa, or metaphorical poop, like William Wilberforce or Martin Luther King Jr. And we find that doing hard stuff actually isn't that hard for us because that's what happens in the life of a believer being shaped by the Holy Spirit. Doing hard stuff for a mature Christian isn't about gritting your teeth and pretending it's okay. It honestly ceases to be hard. As you walk with Jesus, hard becomes easy. We're fearless. We're those crazy people helping someone in the middle of the street while bullets are whizzing overhead. Could we be hurt? Of Of course we could, but can we be harmed? Absolutely not. So we walk right out into the middle of the battle and start helping. Okay, one last time. The world is broken. It doesn't work the way it was intended. But we are secure. We can be hurt, but we cannot be harmed. Therefore, we can be fearless, helping, living, loving in a broken world without fear. 
Is that a compelling picture of Christian maturity or what? Let me pray. Dear Lord, thank you again for this place and the hearts in this room and how they're being equipped uh, to run the good race and fight the good fight. Give us clear eyes to see the world as it truly is, a beautiful yet scary place at the same time, but also give us clear eyes to see that we have nothing to lose, that we are secure in your love, that we can be hurt but we cannot be harmed. And let us be fearless as we engage with the world and carry your love to people in need. Thank you again for this day and for the people here. In your son's name, amen.